Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. John says, the beast that thou sawest was. Remember John saw the church slaughtering and killing all those people, and he saw a scarlet covered beast that was. Now, that word was is a past tense word, and it means at some point in time that it came to an end. We've already described that beasts are political powers, and that this political power, the scarlet covered beast, is represented by the political power of the papacy. But it says it was. That means past tense to when John is seeing the vision. In other words, John's seeing the vision, and the angel says, what you just saw back here was. When in history do we see the end of the political power of the Roman Catholic political system, the papacy? When did that occur in history? Napoleon Bonaparte hates the church. He's an atheist. He sets out to conquer Europe. And in the year 1798, on February 10, he sends a letter to his general Berthier. And he says, Capture Pius VI, remove him from Rome. Politically, this church is dead. And he shocked and stunned the world. So 1798 goes down as a key date in history when the political power of the Roman Catholic Church system, the papacy, came to a dead end. John says, and is not. In other words, the second phase of the church is not. It has lost its control over the kings of the earth. No longer does it control them as it did previous to 1798. You can't tell a king to stand out in the snow any longer. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, when you've been beating up on somebody and, and killing them and tearing them apart, and they grab you and they throw you in a pit, you can't fight anymore. The bottomless pit is a fit symbol of restraint. In Revelation 20, you'll notice that the devil, Satan, is thrown into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. No one to tempt, no one to annoy. He's all by himself, strapped down. He's restrained. So the bottomless pit is a fit symbol of restraint. But it says that he shall ascend out of that bottomless pit and go into perdition. In other words, he's going to get out of the restraint and go into perdition, which is a Greek word meaning destroyed. Now let's, let's take a close look at the word perdition. What does the Bible have to say about perdition? Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-8. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now you know, what well, withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? He's going to be revealed, folks. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth let him let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The son of perdition is to be destroyed by the second coming of Christ. And he is also to be revealed. And it says he's a man. Let's turn back to Revelation 17. <clears throat> so it says he goes into perdition. Verse 8. And they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was, is not, and yet is. What John is seeing is the dark ages as was, ending in 1798 when Napoleon put a stop to it by decree. He's seeing the is not after 1798 when the papacy no longer controls the political power of the church of the uh, kings of the earth. In other words, it does not have that power to tell a king to go jump into the snow. It can't tell him what to do. It's restraint. And yet is. The yet is is when he goes into perdition and is destroyed. During the time of the yet is, we see the second coming of Christ coming and destroying the son of perdition. Verse 9, 
And here is wisdom which, here is, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Did you notice that the woman is not sitting on the back of the scarlet covered beast? It's not sitting on the horns. It's sitting on the heads. Why? Well, you know, a woman represents a church, right? And a beast represents the political power. But the woman is predominantly sitting on the heads. That means that you're seeing during the time of the seven heads, you're seeing predominantly the church. But John says the beast that controls the kings of the earth is not. So what are we seeing after 1798? We do see a church, but we don't see the political power controlling the kings of the earth. That's why John is seeing this woman predominating on those seven heads. Now, do you remember from Daniel 7, we learned that the third world kingdom represented by the leopard, if you will look up on a split screen now, you'll see a split screen. You'll see at the top, you will see a leopard representing Greece with four heads, and the bottom you'll see the beast of chapter 13 with seven heads. What I'm portraying is that these heads belong to these political powers represented. On the top, you see Greece, the four heads, the four generals of the Greek Empire. On the bottom, you see the seven-headed leopard beast of chapter 13. The same political power that we're discussing now with seven heads. But remember, John says that he sees these seven heads during the is not. Seven heads, seven mountains, and then there's seven kings. <clears throat> so what we need to do is we need to go to the Vatican and look at, its, at the Vatican and its structure. The Vatican is a monarchy. Like England, we have King Henry VIII. Well, the Vatican is a monarchy. We have 79 names in church history. Pius, Leo, Gregory, these kind of names. They put number counts beside the names to designate how many individual leaders use that specific name. Now, it says in verse 9, Here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So if we look at the Vatican website, or their official list, we scroll down to 1798 because remember the seven heads come during the heads come during the is not. Who's the head of the United States? You can answer that. This film may be seen later. They may be another president, but you know who the head is. Now we're talking about the head of the political power of the church, the Roman Catholic Church system. Who are the heads? After 1798 during the is not. We have if you will look up on the screen here, are listed seven heads of the political power of the church. We have Pius, we have Leo, Gregory, Benedict, and John. We have Paul, and we have John Paul. Those are the seven heads of the political power of the Roman Catholic Church since 1798. During the time period in which, which the church is restrained, they no longer have control over the kings of the earth. It's the restraining phase. It says there are seven mountains. Now, we're going to be going into this deeper, but originally Protestantism taught that these seven mountains represented the seven hills that Rome sits on. But there's more to it than just that. Now it says, and there are seven kings. John says at the time he sees the vision, five are fallen. It says one is one is the sixth is in power when he sees the vision. What is the five fallen? Well, the first five used after 1798 were Pius, Leo, Gregory, Benedict, and John. One is. John is seeing the vision from a standpoint of the sixth one is, which was Paul. Why is John seeing the vision from the standpoint in time of Paul? Well, let's go to the Vatican and ask him. Paul is noted in history for Vatican II, pushing the ecumenical movement to reunite Protestants back to Rome. You Protestants are saying, what? He wants to reunite the political power of the papacy.